Hi friends, welcome back to Duke Majin Wilderness Park in the city of Glendale. My name's Jeff Weinstein, and today we have a special guest. We have John Pearson with us today. John's a retired park planner. He's a landscape architect. He knows a lot about the native plants, and that's our theme for today, the native plants of Duke Majin Wilderness Park. But before we hit the trail, John, I've got a couple questions. What exactly is a native plant? And then I hear about drought tolerant plants. And then I know you work to remove the invasive plants that show up here. Maybe you could tell our audience what those are. Uh, native plants are plants that grow naturally in an area that have been here for generations before human beings came here, not ones that you bought at the nursery, but plants that grow naturally in a place like Wilderness Park. Uh, these plants have been growing here for many generations. Uh, they have symbiotic relationships, uh, beneficial relationships with uh, the insects, the animals, the birds, and the other plants in the area that have developed over generations, over hundreds of years. And these make for a fine ecological balance in the, in the, uh, the vegetation in the uh, environment. And when other plants start coming in from outside, the birds bring in seeds, animals bring in seeds, you bring in seeds on the clothes or on your cars, and colonies of invasive plants, invasive species come into the plant and start colonizing along the trails. That affects the ecological balance and it is detrimental to the, the health of the plants. So we try to keep, uh, it, it's impossible to keep all of the invasive plants out, but we try to keep uh, extremely invasive plants from colonizing here. A lot of things go into determining what kind of plants grow into an area. Uh, primarily how much water the plants get, how much rainfall, how steep the slopes are so that the water doesn't run off away from the plants, how porous the soil is so that it's retained for the, uh, the plants, how much sunlight the area gets. A lot of factors determine what plants are going to grow in an area. We have four plant communities at Wilderness Park, two in the upper drier areas and two in the, the stream bed areas, which are called riparian zones. The two riparian uh, communities are uh, riparian woodland and alluvial fan scrub. We're standing in the middle of a creek bed right now. You can see in the background, this is Dunsmore Creek, upper D Dunsmore Creek has uh, a stream flow all year round. Uh, it has dense areas of trees in the stream bed, uh, oaks, tall willows, sycamores, uh, he heavily wooded areas in, in the upper parts of Dunsmore Creek where there's running water year round. When you get down in the, in the southern part of, of Dunsmore Creek where there is no year round flow and it dry out, dries out after the rainy season, you can see it's much more sparse in here. Uh, we have some willows, we have some mule fat, uh, there's buckwheat, less woody plants, uh, much more herbaceous plants. We're now in the upper part of the park, the drier part of the, the park, and there are two plant communities up here, the chaparral, uh, big woody plants, and uh, the inland sage scrub, which are much smaller, less dense plants. Most of the, the park is covered by a chaparral. In some disturbed areas, like along this trail here, or some areas where the soil conditions are different, you have inland sage scrub. Now you're used to the term, more used to the term, coastal sage scrub. This is inland sage scrub because we're farther, far enough inland that there isn't much marine influence here. So the temperatures are a little bit higher, the humidity is a little bit lower, and you have a little bit different mix than you do in the coastal sage scrub. But you have plants like Yerba Santa, Eriodictyon here, California sagebrush, buckwheat. These are very typical medium uh, size to small size, uh, more herbaceous plants and less woody plants. And as we go uh, farther up the trail here, we'll get to more uh, uh, larger chaparral plants that we can talk about. You can see the shrubs in this area are a lot woodier and a lot larger. There are five ceanothus plants. Ceanothus is one of the, the dominant chaparral plants. Uh, there are two ceanothus that are most common on the site. Uh, chaparral whitethorn, very spiny plant. Hoary leaf ceanothus, which is in bloom right now. 
looking out over Dunsmore Canyon, you can see that, that uh, the area is pretty much covered with chaparral plants, but you can also see a lot of coastal sage plants in here, particularly in the disturbed area along the trail. There used to be a fifth community at Wilderness Park, uh, the Big Cone Spruce Woodland. But most of the Big, Lone and Big Cone Spruces were logged out in the late 1800s. There are only a few scattered remnants of, of the, the natural Big Cone Spruce in the park. We have a program now to try to restore the Big Cone Spruce to the park and we're using a lot of volunteer help with that. Uh, we did have a fire here in 2009. So all of this is fairly young vegetation that you're seeing out here. It's uh, been 12 years, uh, another 10 years, and all of this chaparral uh, plant area will, will be much bigger and much denser and much woodier than it is right now. This is an intermediate stage in the chaparral community that you're seeing right now. So we're actually in a drought again. We're not seeing the green plants. We're not gonna have the wildflowers this year, but these plants are adapted to living in this harsh environment. Some of the plants have a sort of a waxy coating on them. Others, like the Yerba Santa, are actually furry or hairy, and that helps to uh, retain their moisture. A lot of the plants in this area have very small leaves. You can look at the plants around me, very small leaves and very light in color. We don't have the dark, dark greens that you might have of a big leaf plant that has a lot of moisture, snow, water. So these are all adaptations to help these plants survive. And then the last one I wanted to talk about was the laurel sumac. If you look at this plant leaf, instead of being open where it has a large surface area that could dry out, the plant is actually folded over almost like a taco shell. So it preserves its moisture by not being exposed to the sun. These are all ways that these plants have learned and adapted to survive in this harsh environment. So I hope you uh, have learned a little something today about our native plant communities here at Duke Magian. I wanna thank John Pearson for uh, sharing his time with us. If you'd like to learn about the plants, we are actually going to be posting the plant list on the Glendale Parks at Home site uh, along with this video. So you'll have a chance to, to see the list of plants here. And there's a number of books out there that talk about the native plants in Southern California. So we hope that you get out on the trail, you look around, get interested in those plants, and we hope to see you out here again real soon. Thank you and take a hike.